New Year. Thank you. Thank you. Well, here we are on a Wednesday night, getting locked in and started. Um, if you don't know or aren't aware, um, we, on the first Wednesday of each month, um, we call these First Focus. Um, so we're going to be praying together tonight a little bit uh, and learning about how to pray into things in the scriptures. So that should be a lot of fun for us. Last year, we worked through the Lord's Prayer. And so we took a little phrase kind of each month and talked through that. And this year, um, we're going to be doing Second Chronicles 7.14 and going to be unpacking that. And so I'll explain a little bit tonight, kind of give you a mini introduction. And then we're going to touch on one word tonight. Um, and we're going to unpack, of course, because, you know, I'm weird, and we can teach a whole, you know, night on one word, um, and it's probably not a word that you would think it's going to be, um, so hopefully you'll, you'll bear with uh, the strangeness of that, um, but I, I am really excited because, you know, this year, um, if, if you haven't heard, or I want to just put this little plug in, um, we are going to be reading uh, the Gospels um, starting next Tuesday until Easter. And so we'll be doing the book of Luke in January. Uh, in February, we'll be doing uh, the book of John. Uh, in March, we will be doing the book of Matthew. And then the week of Passion Week, we will be reading the whole book of Mark. Um, and, that, and so what that averages out is one chapter a day. Um, and we're really just wanting to encourage everyone in the community, can we read one chapter a day until Easter? And then the week before Easter, Mark is short, but it's two chapters a day. So it's a little bit. <laughs> and there's a few break days or catch-up days that we've scheduled. Um, but if you want to jump into that, um, you just text the word READ. And um, we'll send you that little layout on Sunday um, so you can see, you know, just so you can track with us. Uh, and then we'll also give, like, just some periodic reminders, encouragements, like, hey, if you, if you miss January, jump on in February. You know, grab at least one of the Gospels um, before Easter because um, I think it's going to be really significant. And then, secondarily, uh, on Wednesday night, starting next week, we are going to be talking about a spirit-led church, and we're going to be looking at the book of Acts, and we're going to be looking at specific things that the book of Acts demonstrates as they are spirit-led. Um, and so it's going to be really fun. Some really unique topics are going to come up. We have a lot of different people who are speaking, so that should also be fun, mixing it up. Because, um, you know, last fall, I think... I taught almost every Wednesday night, it seemed. Uh, there, was a, there was a lot of them. And um, so hopefully, hopefully it'll be great to get some beautiful voices, um, you know, with us here and, and looking at some really unique things. I'm, I'm particularly excited just uh, with some of the people that we feel like the Lord's highlighted to us to ask. Um, and I know it's going to be a good time because whether you know it or not, New Song is a church that's driven and led by the Spirit. And maybe we don't always look like a traditional church that's led by the Spirit, but we are very much led by the Spirit, and we're trying to help everyone see those things in a different way. Um, because unfortunately, we have gotten stuck and thinking, this is what a Spirit-led church looks like, and we want to look at the scriptures to really understand what a Spirit-led church looks like, which are not always the same. Um, so tonight, we are going to be... Um, in this wonderful section of scripture from Chronicles. And I just thought that it would be helpful for us to um, talk a little bit introductory information about Chronicles before we get into the one thing we're going to talk about tonight. But before we do, I would just love to invite you all to just pray with me. Um, and we're going to ask the Lord to speak to us. Um, I think sometimes it's really easy for us to say things like that. But I've been really sensing in my heart that this year, 2024, is going to be a year that we have to really focus on listening. Um, there's something about listening this year that's really imperative. And 
So I want to make sure that we start kind of with a, a moment where we're going, all right, let's unclog these ears. <laughs> let's leave behind everything we've heard throughout the day. Let's maybe leave behind everything we've heard in our life about some of these things that we're going to talk about tonight, and let's receive what the Lord would speak to us, the implanted word that it might bring forth fruit in our hearts. So, Jesus, we just thank you that there is never a time that you did not listen to the Father. And so here we are tonight, Lord, coming before you to listen to you speak again. Would you speak words of life, words that are creative in nature, words that bring life and healing and wholeness? And Lord, I pray that we would find ourselves overwhelmed by what you're trying to say. And so Lord, just come and be amongst us and be with us as we, we look in your word and we look at just a simple, simple one word uh, and help us understand what you might be calling us into as we learn to pray in a unique way tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So when Pastor Alvin was telling us about these First Focus Wednesday nights, he's like, hey, I want us to pray through Second Chronicles seven fourteen, And we've probably heard it at some point in our life. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek, their fa- seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land, right? There, I mean, I kind of give a paraphrase. There's a few other pieces in there. And so as I sat there and was like, okay, he looks at me and he goes, so you're going to set out how everything is laid out for this for the rest of the year, which last year he did the Lord's Prayer. So I was like, great, I don't have to worry about that. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, I come out of staff meeting and Chris and I were like chatting for a second. Um, and I sit down in, at my desk and I just read through it and I literally just typed everything that came to my heart and my mind. And I felt like the Lord just gave me all of these prayers that he wants us to learn how to pray from this passage. So I'll just tell you what they are, and you can, you know, get a little sneak peek of what we'll be praying through each month. So we're going to be praying through the prayer of possibility, the prayer of personhood, the prayer of purpose, the prayer of position, the prayer of penitence, the prayer of practice, the prayer of presence, the prayer of perspective, the prayer of petition, the prayer of pardon, the prayer of patching up, and the prayer of place. And so I think we're going to have a great time. I also didn't intentionally make all of those P words. That's just what I heard uh, from the Lord. Um, and uh, <laughs> and so I'm excited tonight. We're going to be talking about uh, the prayer of possibility. And um, I'm excited to share with you just a few things that the Lord's been highlighting to me. But as we start, I want to first start with Chronicles. What are Chronicles? Why are we even talking about Chronicles? What is this book about? And I can honestly say it is not a book that people run to to study. Um, Primarily because if you've read Kings and you've read Samuel, uh, you're getting most of that content all over again in Chronicles. But there's a whole lot more names, (laughs) A whole lot more genealogies. Uh, First Chronicles starts with incredible amounts of genealogies. And, um, and in fact, First and Second Chronicles in the Hebrew culture, there is no First and Second. It's one book. It's just Chronicles. Um, but in that day that they were writing, they ran out of paper in the scroll, so they had to have two scrolls. That's why there's First and Second. So th- hopefully that also helps you frame this, that this is one big, long book, And if you were to read it all together, you would get one big, big picture. And the picture of the book um, is unique unique for a couple reasons. One, it is anonymous, so we have no idea who wrote it. Um, But we do know about when it was written. So we've talked about Ezra and Nehemiah on Wednesday nights before. That is the post-exile Israelites who've come out of Babylon and they've reestablished themselves Uh, in Jerusalem, and they're rebuilding the temple, right? We build the second temple, which is the temple that Jesus later comes in contact with when he interacts with the temple. And, um, And so after Ezra and Nehemiah, Chronicles is written, and the author of Chronicles has basically decided to do a survey of all of these things that are going on in Kings and Samuel 
to do one big thing for us. And that's to say, we're still looking for a king who is going to change everything because we haven't found him yet and we need a better temple. Those are the two big pictures that are developed through the whole book of Chronicles. If you read through it, all it's going to talk about is David has a lineage. It's a dynasty. And every king should be like David. And when the Messiah comes, he's going to be like David. And so there's this whole mindset that you have to be a king like David if you're going to be the Messiah. It's interesting that in Chronicles, there's literally a lot of edits. You don't get a whole lot of the bad side of David, so to speak. Like you don't get Bathsheba, you don't get Uriah, you don't get him chasing Saul in the wilderness, and you don't get any of that. You just get all of the good that David has because they're trying to prepare their hearts for the Messiah who's coming. Because um, obviously in their mind, the Messiah is not going to be one who's going to do bad things. So we're trying to extract from David who that Messiah is going to be, what he's going to be like. And it's saying to the second temple people, he is still coming. We're not there yet, but he is still coming. And then secondly, there was all of the hubbub around building the second uh, temple because it just wasn't as good as Solomon's. Now, if you go back and you read about Solomon's temple, it was magnificent. It was gold, it was big, it was grand, like just grandiose in all ways, shapes, fashions, and forms. And so there's this sense of like, now we have this like puny second temple. Now, really, it's not puny. If you were to like look at the measurements, you're like, no, this is still a very large edifice. But they felt like it wasn't significant enough. And so the second part of Chronicles is really highlighting to them, there's going to be a better temple. It's... When this new Messiah comes and he, he brings the kingdom of God and he establishes God's kingdom for all of Israel, it's also going to have a better temple. And so the whole thing is just locking and loading their hearts and their minds into realizing he's coming. We don't know when. We know he's going to be like David. And that's about all we know. And then we know there's going to be a better temple. And so um, with that in mind, uh, we walk, you walk through all of Chronicles seeing these different pictures of the Messiah and of temples, particularly. And, and so when you get into Second Chronicles um, and you get into chapters 1 through about chapter 9, you get all of this magnificent expression of Solomon. Now, one of the things that's really special about Solomon is that he's a lot like David in some ways, and he's nothing like David in other ways. So he's primarily a man of peace. Um, we see that. He basically doesn't want to fight with anybody. He doesn't want to go to war with anybody. Um, and, and we see that in the scriptures, the Lord says that Solomon can build the temple because there's too much blood on David's hands. So there's a redemptive, restorative reality that David could have been the one who built the temple, but he's a fighter. And we need to like not have the king who's a fighter. We need a king who is a man of peace. So Solomon's this man of peace. And in chapter 7, where our verse that we're focusing on is couched, um, we get the picture of Solomon dedicating his temple. And we kind of get an a, telling, a retelling of the story. And it's a crazy story. I mean, they sacrificed 22,000 animals. Like, I want you to think about that for a second. 22,000 plus animals because they wanted that level of sacrifice to God. Um, and you're like, why would they do 22,000? Um, because they're really, really in their mind. If God does not have a temple, then they cannot be his people because he will not be in the middle of them. Um, he will be out and about and far. And in the ancient Near Eastern world, all of the gods rage, and they're in the, the heavenlies, but they almost never come down and make habitation, which is why Yahweh is so unique, because he says, I want to come, I want to be amongst you, I want to be with you. I don't want you to think that I'm far off, I'm going to be in this thing right here. And so, um, in the beginning of chapter 7, uh, he, he dedicates it to the Lord, he, he, it's such a beautiful thing, I mean, crazy things happen, God comes in such a powerful way that no one can even function. Um, there's no one who can offer anything else. They're all just uh, overwhelmed by the glory of God. 
and, and just filled with the presence of God in that space because God has said, this is going to be my people and this is going to be my place. And he was so full in that place that they started to sing um, the, 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 love, the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. Uh, his mercies endure forever. And that was their response to the Lord showing up in such a magnificent way. And then you get to chapter, uh, um, you get to verse uh, 14. And what we end up seeing is that Solomon um, has a history with God where God appears to him in the night. Uh, he's a dreamer of sort, or he has encounters in the night, or some sort of a, moments where God appears to him. And right after this big dedication of the temple, God appears to him. And you're like, well, that's you know, beautiful, it's wonderful. God's kind of externally manifested himself, and now he's just showing him to Solomon. And, and in this moment, he says to Solomon um, that, hey, <laughs> there are going to be times where you all are not going to follow me. There's going to be times when you're going to miss me. And because you divorced yourself from me, bad things are going to happen like famine and pestilence and all these horrible things will happen. And he's like, but I want you to know that if those things happen, there's a way out. And that is the introduction to this prayer that we're going to be learning to pray through. And so as we, as we step into it, I think that, um, that for all of us, and this is going to sound heavy, but I hope that you can hear it in a new way, that this whole prayer... If my people who humble themselves, you know, um, will turn from their wicked ways. And there's, there's four major verbs in, in, the, in the passage. Um, and, and seek my face, I will, you know, I will heal their land. Is that it is a prayer of repentance. Now, the problem with a word like repentance is we got a churchy mindset on it. <laughs> right? We're like, oh, repentance. This means somebody's bawling uncontrollable on their knees at the altar. Or, or you know, there's some picture, character that comes into your mind concerning repentance. But I, I hope that you can hear this, and you might have heard someone talk about it before. But it actually means to return. The Hebrew word for repent means to return. Which means that at some point, you were in the right place, and in the right way, and in the right fashion, and you've wandered and you've done, your own, you've done your own things. And now it's time to return back to your starting place. Back to the place that you were designed to be and designed to function in. Um, Pastor Alvin on Sunday alluded to this when he was saying that you might have wandered, you might have done all these things, but, but go back to your mother's womb. That's where the Lord fashioned you and formed you and made you, and that's the place you're supposed to live from, not all of the formations of this world. And, um, and so I think for us, as we step into it, it's like, oh my gosh, like repentance, I feel like, oh, I'm such a sinner, and I just need the grace of God, and I'm a worm, and there's all of this couched in repentance a lot of the time. But I just want to encourage you to think that Repentance is just returning all things back to the Lord. Every part of your heart and your life and your mind and your relationships, it's returning them all back to him. And if we can return everything back to him, there is the promise of everything being righted and restored. And so as we come into this famous passage of, if my people who are called by my name, you know, that it's an invitation to us to recognize that there is a restoration available today. There is a restoration of all of the things that doesn't feel like it can ever be fixed and restored, but there is an invitation to step into that place of prayer. And so what I would love for us to start, it's a simple question where you're going to get in groups of two or three, and, and the question that I'd love for you all to answer is, how, how do you see prayer as an act of restoration? How do these things connect? How do these things touch each other? Um, how, does, how does prayer show you that return? Does that make sense? All right, so break into your groups, three, maybe three people in a group or four. 
um, we're asking the question, how does prayer reveal to us that return to restored relationship? Or how has prayer been that for you in your life? Or how can we imagine um, prayer being a return to our relationship with God? Ready, set, go. I'll give you like six minutes.
All right. Uh, let's hear from some of the groups. How do you see prayer as an act of restoration or return to God? We'll start in the back over here. It removes shame. Okay. This group. It's a conversation. It's humility. Humility and surrender. This is group. new level of freedom we're unlocking that happens because of prayer I like that it's cool in the back mom and son duo what choice love it Love it. Other ones? This crew? You wondered how often we need to be restored. It's a great question, John. Yeah. 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 No, I think that that's a I think that's a really good a really good insight is how often have we just stepped away every now and then? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. I love it. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And, it, and it's, I think it's really important. I mean, I think... I think we find this a lot in all relationships that, um, you know, there, there's this old saying that most of the time when people are talking to you about something, they don't actually want you to change anything. They just want you to listen. And your listening actually brings the connection more than your ability to fix it and figure it out. And I wonder if in some ways, you know, prayer does help us reorient ourselves not where we're coming to pray just to get something from him but more coming into the place where we're with him and when we're with him what happens who knows we really have no idea what could happen with him which is part of what we're talking going to be talking about tonight because you know the word that we're focusing on tonight is just the simple word if I mean, this prayer of restoration starts with this little word, if. Some versions don't even translate it as if. They translate it as and. But if you read the verse ahead, just so you know, it's, it's a conjunction. So the ifs are continuing, even if it's not explicit in your Bible. And, and this word, if, is, is a, a strange word. Like, if you think about it, if you're trying to describe somebody, what is if? You know, uh, I, I think it's not that easy to explain, like, if means this. And so I was, like, writing down a bunch of things, like, oh, what could if mean? You know, it's like, oh, um, you know, it's normally a conditional word. If this, then that, right? That's how they teach it a lot in school. The conditional statement, you know, uh, has the if and the then. Um, I wrote that it's the, it is a word that sometimes is full of possibility. That if I'm wondering or if that could be a reality or if that could happen, uh, it's a word of hypothesis. It's a curiosity word, which I think is really important as we come into the place of prayer, that we don't just come into prayer just trying to fix it. 
We don't just come to God just trying to fix the thing. We come into relationship to say, I'm open to the possibility. Now, what is the possibility? It could be different for all of us as we're going to find tonight. But it's funny to me. I thought this was very interesting. The, the Hebrew word for if is hain. Um, so, you know, you remember, right, that this, that's a long vowel <laughs> from grade school. Hain. And, and, um, and so often it's translated low, right? King James mostly. And most of our modern translations, they translate it as behold. Which is funny because I don't always think of if as being a low and a behold moment. But if you think if you think about it, you recognize that if postures you to look. And so what happens when I step into the place of prayer? I start looking for something. I start looking for anything that I, I'm open to receive. It was just so funny because, you know, I was sitting there reading through this verse, and it, I, I read the if, and I just, I felt like the Lord just pressed pause on me in that moment. And I was like, what? And he's like, Jason, too many of us are not praying with possibility. It's funny because a lot of the work that I do are, are with people who are learning how to have relationship with each other. And most of the time, <laughs> almost all the time, one party wants to be right, and that means the other party has to be wrong, right? This is normal fights that we have in relationships. It doesn't matter if it's moms, dads, parents, children, husbands, spouses. It's every relationship. Basically, somebody thinks they're right, and the other person thinks that they're wrong. And that is all of the tension. But if they came into the moment of relationship with each other, and they decided that they were going to set aside their rightness and their wrongness and be open then there might be other options available. If is almost like an invitation to brainstorm with God. Where you're not just coming to God and saying, all right, God, I want you to do this thing, and that's going to be great because this is what I'm hoping you'll do. And it's also not God coming to you and saying, hey, you have to do this or else. So much of it is you come into that moment with him and you're like, what could we do? What could happen if we were together? Could this change? If we were together, how could it be different? And all of a sudden, we're caught up in this moment where we begin to imagine our whole lives with God, not without him. That our return our repentance brings us back to the place, not where he's sitting there ready to beat us up for everything we didn't do right and how we went down the wrong path and how we did the wrong thing, but it's more about him saying, hey, you've come into this place now, and then what can happen? You know, because otherwise, if we don't come into prayer with the if mindset, then we feel like we're throwing spaghetti at the wall waiting for something to stick. Or we're yelling at the ceiling, expecting a result. But if we come in with an if, if we come in with this behold, this low, this let's look at the whole thing. Let's look, like if we stopped right now and you thought about something that you're praying about and you want it in this, in this specific way, what you're missing is all the other ways it could happen. That you've narrowed everything down and made it very small and very limited. And the God of the universe is not limited. Why are we trying to force him into a small, narrow mindset on everything that could happen for our lives? Because we come into this thing thinking that we're right. And the if invitation to our prayer is to say, I don't have to be right. And God's like, well, I'm not trying to force my rightness on you, but can we do this thing together? Can we be invited to look and behold all of the possibilities in the universe? It's so funny that um, in, in premarital counseling, um, 
we talk about this a lot. <laughs> Where, you know, she wants to do it this way, and he wants to do it that way. And, and what you realize, like 90% of the time, if you sit down with this mindset for possibility, this mindset for openness, this mindset for brainstorming, you realize that neither one of your ways is actually better than the other way. It's just different. Now, you can keep fighting over whose different way is better, or you can come up with a way where both people feel like they're in it together. Our prayer is to bring us to the place where we're doing the whole thing together. If it's a vending machine, it's not together. Because I can walk away from a vending machine whenever I get what I want and leave it behind. This is the danger of praying to God like a vending machine. But a prayer of possibility says, it's more like GPS. I have no idea what I'm doing with my life, but if I am with him, we can recalculate, recalculate. New route found. Seven minutes cut off your time. Like, we can live in that place of prayer with the Lord if we believe that prayer is a prayer of possibility. And this hope for restoration that Israel, who's come out of exile, they've come out of captivity, and the Lord's already saying, you're probably going to get it messy and wrong. I want you to come back and reimagine with me what it could be. I want you to come back, and I want to do it with you instead of you doing it by yourself and thinking that we're going against each other. We're on the same team. What happens when we pray that way? What happens when we start looking and beholding not just him, but everything? Because if is about seeing. (laughs) It's funny because I I looked this up. Um, You can see very clearly. It comes from two words. Be and hold. Hooray. (laughs) And the word be means about, around, um, or, or sometimes even so far to say on all sides, which I love. And then hold means to keep, to guard, to tend. And our prayer of possibility really starts and really happens when I first recognize that he is about me and around me and on all sides. And when he is, then I can keep my focus on the about, around, and all sideness of him. And my guard is always there because he's about, around, and on all side of me. And then I can tend to anything because he's with me. This is beholding. This is looking at the world and not fearing and not worrying and not being overcome by the pestilence and the famine and the, and the locust and all the things that in the Bible we see happening. And today it's maybe not those words, but maybe it's anxiety or maybe it's fear or maybe it's um, a wrong desire. But we don't have to worry about any of that if we're with him, beholding in prayer and looking at the whole thing and saying, Recalculating. Okay, let's let's look over here. Let's look over here. Let's look over here. And the stories that we read in the scriptures are so often that. And very rarely are they point A to point B. And we're too hard on ourselves because we think that God is expecting us to go from point A to point B. And he's saying, I don't care what points you're going to. I just want to be with you. That is the way we approach the prayer that brings us back into a return and back into relationship. I remember a professor said this to me. It was so upsetting to me. <laughs> I was about to graduate undergrad. He was my favorite professor of all time. He, he taught this beautiful book on Exodus that I felt like wrecked me forever. And I did his men's Bible study. I did all these things. I spent so much time with him the last two years of my undergrad. And we sat down, and I was like, all right. I'm like, Doc, I'm like, I could go into counseling and be a professional counselor because I'm really fascinated about interiority and the inner world, and I feel all the time. I could, I could do worship 
follow the pathway or to do worship and sing my guts out to the Lord and, and that could be great because I'm always passionate about that. Or, because he's my inspiration, I'm going to be a, an Old Testament professor. I'm going to give my whole heart to being, you know, as nerdy as he was. I mean, he was like reading Ugaritic, guys, like these dead languages nobody cares about. And, and I'm like, you know, and I was like, oh, or maybe, you know, I can do the Old Testament thing and then teach worship because there's so much in the Old Testament about worship. You know, I'm like trying to cross hatch and, and I look at him, I'm like, what do you think I should do? What does God want me to do? And he looked at me and he said, you can do anything. It doesn't matter because he's with you. Now, listen, we love to be obsessive about our versions of destiny and God's plan, will, and purpose for our lives. Are we not? It's a very manifest destiny mindset. It's very much driven by the establishment of how our nation was created, that I get what I want, and I can grab it, and capitalism, and all these things that are not inherently bad. But what I'm saying is, is that God's way? No. His plan, his purpose, his will for you, is that you would be with him. That's the point. Remember, salvation is the point. <laughs> what is salvation? That we would be brought back into relationship fully with him. He's saving you from everything else but himself. And this is hard for us because we all want to feel like that's special. I have this purpose. I have this vision. I have this dream. And I'm like, yeah, but you have him. He's actually better. Because you know what happens? And you can ask anybody in, who's lived any amount of time. That they came up with A, step A, I'm going to do X with my life. And they walk over, ta, 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 and they get to that point, and they're like, oh, crap, i got to come up with something else. And, then, da, 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 da. and so many people have to keep putting points on the map thinking that when they get to that point, it's going to fulfill them. And the problem is, is it won't. It's only him. In all your life, in the rest of your existence, your heart will long to only be with him. And no job and no relationship and no amount of money or success will ever fulfill that. Controversial, I'm sure this feels. Because it's so contrary to the way the world thinks and operates. But this is the prayer of possibility. The prayer of possibility, just to use our wild pastor as an example, is God takes a man who knows nothing about technology and ask him to start a tech company. You, to this day, Pastor Alvin does not know anything about coding. He does not know anything. Like, he can barely program his iPhone. Like, genuinely, and God gave him a company to run. It's crazy. And then, and then these other moments where I'm talking to him about something, and he's like, yeah, all of a sudden, I'm sitting there, and I'm talking to this guy, and he's like, hey, would you maybe, like, Give me some money so I can make this film about, like, my great-great-great-grandmother. And because he's with God in his crazy way that Pastor Alvin is, he's, like, now a movie producer. <laughs> because he did this for his friend. And then all of a sudden you're talking to him, and he's like, oh, yeah, my cousin wants to do this thing. And he, and he like, all of a sudden he's doing this thing with his, with his nephew, I mean. And you're like, this just doesn't make sense. These are not any of the things that he's wanting to do or great at doing. He's just doing it with God. And for so many of us, that is hard because we've trained and raised our brains and our hearts and our minds to think that when we get to this certain destination, that's it. But at the end of that, you're going to die unless you have him. And then you live with him forever. That's the whole point to be with him, to be in connection. And this possibility says we can walk around the whole map and everything can change. I mean, my own life, I would just give you a simple moment, but, but that, doesn't, that kept changing again and again. I never wanted to be a pastor, ever. I really didn't want to. Like, it was so intense that when we moved here and I was, like, starting to pastor, the Lord's like, so you're going to take three years and you're going to learn how to be a pastor because you don't want to be it. I want you to stop fighting I'm like, I don't want to do this. He's like, it's not about doing this. It's about being with me. I'm like, oh, okay. If I'm with you, you can do this. Oh, if you're with me, oh, cool, great. You know, it's like, 
And then all of a sudden you realize all of these moments in your life have very, very little to do with you attaining your goals and so much more about being with him and dreaming with him and following that GPS wherever it takes you. And guess what? I'm assuming that when I'm like 60 or something, I'll probably have a different job because it's just what God loves to do. It's just change everything. Because he's way more fascinated and beholding and looking than he is being so concretized to such narrow, simplistic ideas of what you think the world looks like. And it's much, much bigger than that. I was talking to a guy the other day, and he told me that his whole dream, his whole life was to become a politician. And he's like, he's going through all these things in law school, da, 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 da. And he gets to this point where he's right on the edge of working on a campaign. And all of a sudden, because he's with God, the Lord's like, do not do that. And he's like, ah, who knows how much money he spent on law school and on all these. And the Lord's like, I don't want you to do that. I want you to do this other thing. So he curves, does other thing, Boom. Crazy things happen for him because he's with God. Doors open up. Not, now he's not running for office. He's just talking to everybody who's going into office. And he's loving them and bringing the kingdom to them. And, and I'm like, see, it's just bigger than what you think it is. Don't live small. Live with God and live big. And prayer is cultivating that moment with us where whatever I think is or isn't possible, there's more that's possible than there's less that's possible. This if thing is not just about seeing, but it's, it's about time. Oh, we love to do things fast. Oh, we love to get there quick. God forbid you drive 25 minutes around here. My mom started joking on us when she came to visit us. She's like, oh my gosh, we have to drive like 12 minutes to that target or like 11 minutes to that target or like eight minutes to that target. <sighs> it's just so exhausting to drive so far. <laughs> Meanwhile, you know, for her, where she lives, it's like 35 minutes to target, you know, to the only target. <laughs> like, and then like, we just, we, we have this mindset of get there faster, get there quicker, hurry up, hurry, hurry, hurry. But what we miss is there's no possibility in my hurry. Because if I hurry, I've eliminated all other routes. And the detour might be better than the journey that you're on currently. I'm not saying this is pretty. I'm just saying that this is what prayer does to us. It's prayer is this moment where we come in with this if possibility and this if reality. And we realize that the then is on God. Right? Because it's, if my people pray, then he will what? He'll learn. It, the then is on God. The time is on God, not on me and my ability. The if is mostly about me being present to everything that's in front of me. We, we're really struggling with this prayer of possibility. And most of us are never seeing the possibilities that are available because we're trying to get there so fast. You know what they call that? Tunnel vision. Myopia. Where you start seeing so small that the answer could be right outside of your eyesight, but you will never see it. The answer to the prayer you've been praying for hundreds of years, if you were alive that long, could be right there if you came into a place where you believed anything could be possible. Whoever is in your mind that's not there or not where you want them to be or that job that's not what it's supposed to be, guess what? It doesn't mean it's not there. It just means you have to lift your vision higher and wider. And your prayer can do that because you're with him. <laughs> because he's, I love this so much. I was reminded of the, of the Psalms. As I was reading through all this, Psalm 115, it says, that we can be encouraged because we have a God who sees and a God who hears and a God who moves, unlike every other God that's an idol. They have eyes but don't see and ears but don't hear and hands but can't do, and that is not our God. 
And so this time thing is saying that if we're with him right here and right now, we can stay with him as we move into the future. And it doesn't matter how long it takes because it's still possible. And there is almost zero stories that tell us something different in the scriptures because Abraham and Sarah have a child when they are old. And barren women have children when their time is done. And people who think that they haven't got it get it at the end, not at the beginning. And so time is not a big deal to God. In one second, he can do more than in your whole lifetime. If we have a heart that's willing to pray with possibility, with an openness and a curiosity and a wide-eyedness to say, God is actually able to be this and do this for us and with us and sometimes even through us. If is about possibility because if you can see it and you can disregard your version of time, then there is nothing that is impossible. If you can imagine it and you can wait, everything can happen. Luke 1 tells us Mary's response in this moment is for, she's like, how can it be that the Son of God is going to reside in my womb? Well, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. (laughs) You know, just the God of the universe occupying himself in a body, in a body. What happens when God is in your body, in a body? There's nothing that can't happen, friends. There is no limitations that exist when we come into prayer believing that anything is possible. Matthew 19, this is like another passage where we see they're asking the question of who can be saved because they're all worried about the rich not being able to get into the kingdom. And all the rich people are going, hey, how can we get saved then? And Jesus says to them, with man, these things are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And Peter says this. See. See? He's with the Lord. See, we have left everything behind. This is in Matthew 19. And we have followed you. What then will we have? And Jesus says to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, which this verse, the Son of Man, is a Messiah reference. His glorious throne is the place in the temple that he lives and dwells in. When that happens, you who have followed me will also sit as well. It tells us that God is able to bring salvation into every area of our life and existence. And he will fulfill what the chronicler has been trying to tell us, which is that there is a king who has come and there is a kingdom that is begun. And we are only, barely, at the beginning of it. A couple thousand years is not too long for our God to work salvation in our hearts and our lives and in the midst of the earth. And so tonight, I just want to take the next five to ten minutes. And I want you to just sit and I want you to think about something that you feel like is impossible in your life. Impossible. Something that there's no way it could ever seem like it could happen. Or if it's going to happen, it's real far from its quickness to happening or its possibility. And I just want you to take some time. Maybe you can share it with somebody. If you don't feel comfortable, that's okay. But I want you to pray right now that the Lord would show you. That you would behold. And the Lord would show you how big this all is. And how possible everything can be. 
it's funny because my parents told me this story and I kept thinking about it again and again when I was preparing. And they said I was probably four or five and I, I had a wart on my pointer finger. And you know, you're like, that's a wart, it's no big deal. But for whatever reason, for me as a kid, it was the most nightmarish thing <laughs> that I could have ever experienced at that moment. This weird, lumpy, growing thing on my finger. I hated it. And my parents said that I, back in the day, we went to church three times a week, by the way. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Okay, that's how I was raised. And they said, at the end of every single service, I walked up to the front and I'd ask some adult to pray for my wart to go away. And I'm sure that they thought that this is the silliest, most ridiculous thing possible. But something in my heart kept going back. Because I had heard that there was this man who could do anything. And I believed that there was possibility in that prayer. And guess what? One day, I walked up, and that wart fell right off. And as small as a wart is for us, how much more is anything that you think he can't just one moment, one time, one more prayer, one more day, one more hour. And I just feel so strongly that there's such an invitation this year for us to begin to believe again that it is all possible. That whatever you have deemed too far out of your vantage and your perspective, that you would open that thing a little wider and a little higher. It's like they're showing us all these movies that have been filmed in a certain way. And because of our movie theaters, it's chopped off the tops and the sides. But now in IMAX, you can see the whole picture. And that's what the prayer of possibility does for us. That you might think that the, the answer to what you've been searching for isn't there. But you know that there is history that says that they have taken the frames off of famous pieces of artwork and that they have found that there are other things on the artwork, on the canvas that was hidden behind the frame. The prayer of possibility opens up your world to say that there is more than what you currently think or know. And so I want you to just pray for just a few minutes. For whatever you think is impossible. Because just like my wart fell off. And the Lord saved my little finger from carrying that ugly thing. There's nothing that's too simple. Or too silly. Or too large. Or too big. For him to deal with. Will you pray with me? Jesus we just take a moment. To return back to you in this place of prayer. We take that moment to say, Lord, I think we've made these things too small. We've made this thing too narrow. Lord, we want to behold the whole picture. Lord, open up our eyes to all the realms of possibility. Everything that's available every direction, Lord, we ask that you would expand our hearts and our vision to believe that there is nothing that cannot be saved and restored and returned back to you. That even if you've come with glory and with fire and with wonder, Lord, that you can still do things that are beyond that. That you are not limited in any shape, way, fashion, and form. And that your ultimate desire is just to be with us as we do this thing with you. So yes, Lord, we turn back to you for more possibility. More imagination. More vision. Lord, more patience 
when the timing seems strange and off. Lord, we thank you that you can do something in a moment or you can take 35 years to do something. It does not diminish its wonder and its beauty. Lord, we just ask that tonight, Lord, we would be like Mary and we would say, let it be unto me according to what you say. And then our prayer would be that, that we would invite you to tell us and show us that it's not about my way and your way, but it's about us discovering this thing together. Would you help us? Lead us, guide us, GPS us tonight that we would find all of the rerouting is only for our benefit. That you are the journey, you are the destination, and you are the only thing that will bring us the satisfaction our heart is looking for. We ask that tonight our hearts would be open to the prayer of possibility, afresh and anew, that there is nothing too difficult for you. We just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. See you guys next week as we get into the book of Acts. This will be good times. Come on Sunday because Pastor Alvin is uh, sharing with us the word of the year uh, for the church. That is our governing word this Sunday. So come out, hear all about it, and we'll be on that for about a month, uh, unpacking what that vision that he felt like the Lord gave him. So we love you guys. Have a great night.